Welcome to Talk Universe. This is your host, Sir Charles Schultz, and this is our show for Wednesday, September 21st, 2016. This is the second installation of our six-part series on Mars, and tonight we're going to address the question if there is life on Mars, and we're going to look at why there should be, or shouldn't be, So it's going to be an interesting ride, and in order to understand that, there are some things we need to look into. First of all, we need to know how planets form, why there should be life anywhere, or why there shouldn't, and why there's even life on the Earth. We need to examine where it comes from and why it's believed to be common throughout the universe. Most scientists are of the opinion that there should be life everywhere through space, of course limited for the most part to the surface of a planet, And we have to understand why people believe that life exists. So what is life? Well, a child's definition seems to be the best so far. If it moves around and leaves little messes, it's alive. Scientists seem to have no real definition of life. And it's because they don't really understand what it is. Now, we know it when we see it. But how do you quantify it? How do you exactly define it? When you look at something that's alive, it consumes something, such as a food. It produces something, such as a structure or more copies of itself. And it spreads its sort of duplicate or order wherever it goes. Now, for some people, fire would fall into that category. It consumes its fuel and it makes itself larger. But fire isn't alive because in its path it leaves disorder and destruction. Fire does not respond in the same way that life does, nor is it complicated. Then we can look at something like a crystal. It takes materials from its environment, and it puts it in an extremely orderly form, and it does grow over time, and it takes usually a solvent, such as liquid water, and usually a source material for its food, such as silica, and it grows a series of complex structures, the crystal itself, but it isn't alive also doesn't respond to its environment, and it produces too much order. You see, life is not perfect order or perfect disorder. It is a structure that's somewhere in between. But wait a minute, that's only the symptom. What we're actually seeing isn't the life itself. We're seeing the products of life. To understand what life really is, we have to go back another step, and that's to this. Life contains information. Life is a pattern that replicates itself successfully and spreads copies of itself. You see, an organism that simply grew and then died out wouldn't really constitute much in the way of life except for a very brief period. Successful life reproduces, and that's the whole key. It's a self-supporting, self-reproducing pattern of information. What is that information? It's the information in our genes. And everything that you see on the outside is just a symptom or a red flag that that life is there. So where does life come from? In order to know that, we have to know how planets come together and why there should ever be life in the first place. Life works strictly due to the rules of chemistry and physics. And everywhere we look, it should be present. Organic molecules are falling out of space all the time, which makes us ask a very important question. Organic, is it alive or not? Well, that's the trick. Organic molecules aren't necessarily alive. After all, you can take any living organism and you can see that it's made of proteins and sugars and other compounds. There are enzymes, there are histones, there are all kinds of complex molecules in a living organism. But not one of those molecules is alive. You see, it isn't the substance, it's how it is arranged and how it functions. So, where do these organic molecules come from? Well, believe it or not, that was a very important question that was raised many years ago, and a number of scientists decided to check that issue out. Where does all the organic matter come from? Because we know it's present. After all, it's been discovered in meteorites. Amino acids, one of the things that is basic to our life, those are the compounds that are responsible for the formation and structure of proteins. So when a meteorite falls to the ground and you analyze it, and you find many amino acids in it, the question is, where do they come from? Now, we can tell living and non-living matter very easily, even in the form of amino acids. And it has to do with right-handedness or left-handedness. So when a molecule is discovered, we can determine from how it polarizes light, whether it is right-handed or left-handed. When non-biological formation of these molecules occurs, 
And this happens in space, and we'll get to exactly how that happens in a moment. But when these molecules are formed, they usually are a mixture, an even mixture of right and left-handed molecules, completely random. But in a living organism, all the molecules will be left-handed or right-handed because they're making copies of those molecules in the metabolism of a living organism. You see, we eat right-handed sugars and are made of left-handed amino acids and proteins. And we would expect that every organism on Earth would also have left-handed proteins and right-handed sugars. And, overall, that's what we find. Every single living organism on Earth uses the same handedness there's a word for that, chirality. Something is chiral based on how it spirals, <laughs> left or right. And a chiral molecule tells us a lot of things we need to know about its source, particularly when we find large groups of them. Now, the person who made this discovery was Louis Pasteur. He found that when amino acids, or any compound, were made by a living organism, they all had the same handedness. And he did this with crystals of an acid tartaric acid, as a matter of fact. If you look in your spice cabinet, sometimes you'll find cream of tartar, which is used to make certain things. He resolved those crystals into the left-handed and the right-handed molecular forms, because when it grew crystals, it would polarize the light. And Pasteur discovered that any time the polarization was uniform, was the same, that it had to be produced by biological means. So he discovered much more than a vaccine. He actually was a very serious and dedicated researcher who discovered many things to do with biological sciences. And his findings are crucial to us understanding what it means to have life in the universe from the samples that we find. So now we know that there is a source in nature of biological material. And when that biological material rains out of the skies, it should be covering every planet that can receive it. And there's certainly a rain of biology coming from the sky to the earth, or at least biological molecules, organic molecules. We don't think that they are from biology, but we do know that they're organic. So wouldn't this also be true on Mars? After all, the same dust and material from space is falling on all the planets. And the answer is yes. Mars should have its share of organic molecules from space as well. But understand, these are not the molecules that are from life. These are the molecules that are indicators that there is organic matter. There's a big, big difference. So where does it come from, once again? Well, as it happens, that question was answered in the very early 1960s by two scientists, Miller and Urey. They asked themselves the questions. If we ran the film backwards, the life on Earth would become less and less developed, less and less complex, until finally you'd reach a point where we reached a single living organism at the very beginning of the Earth's history. And that's an interesting way of analyzing it. It all must have come from there, but where did that first organism come from? Well, some scientists, such as Fred Hoyle, argued that it might have come from space. He had an idea called panspermia, that organisms formed somewhere, like bacteria, and were spread all throughout the cosmos, carried by comets, meteors, and other bits of material that would arrive on another planet, and therefore life would reach anywhere. But that still didn't go back to the primary question, where did it come from? So they began to do an experiment. They looked at the atmospheres of planets such as Jupiter, which are more or less a thermos bottle of material left over from the formation of the solar system, a sample of the early molecules that were present. And they thought, if we started with that, what would we get if we applied a little energy to it? So they took a large sterile container, a glass container, like a bubble, and they filled it with gases that were found in primitive atmospheres, hydrogen ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, water. Simple, non-organic material. And they made certain it was absolutely sterile. Now they needed energy. And they reasoned, what would it be? It could be heat. It could be lightning. So they put a high-voltage generator in this material, a pair of electrodes, actually, and they ran an electric arc through it. And they circulated the water and the gases throughout this container and let the electric arc pass through it like strokes of lightning would through our atmosphere. And an amazing thing happened. Within a couple of days, the material was straw-colored. Within a couple more days, it was brown, reddish-brown. They ran it for two weeks, and then they stopped the experiment and they opened it, and they found something amazing. Inside this container, starting with lifeless material, they had found 
a reddish-brown tarry substance that, when analyzed, was full of alcohol, solvents, esters, and amino acids, the stuff of life. They had discovered that with simple energy and raw, non-living materials, they could create organic molecules in a huge scale. Now their reasoning was the atmosphere of the early Earth must have been of this composition, and if lightning strokes or even volcanic heat or ultraviolet from the sun were to pass through this material, it would produce these organic molecules. So now we would have a new, raw, sterile planet, but one loaded with organic materials. And that, they reasoned, should be the source of life. But the step from these organic molecules to actual living organisms wasn't known. Well, further experiments showed that every amino acid that is necessary for the formation of life on Earth, and even many that we don't normally see in nature, happened to be present in this material, which they called tholin, T-H-O-L-I-N. And using telescopes, we've discovered that tholin is common throughout our solar system. Even the dark, distant, frozen bodies in our outer solar system, such as Pluto, are covered with this reddish-brown material that matches the spectrum of tholin. So we know that it's present all throughout the universe because the conditions in our solar system are pretty typical. And many exoplanets have been discovered now, and their suns would have the same sorts of materials and the same sorts of zones, where there are hot areas, cold areas, and intermediate areas. And this tholin should form. Because you see, we've discovered that not only lightning, but also volcanic heat can form tholin, and those experiments have been done and confirmed. And the light of a star is rich in ultraviolet, and ultraviolet light is an activator of chemical reactions. We discover huge molecular clouds in space that contain all of the ammonium, methane, hydrogen, and other materials, carbon dioxide, and among those clouds, we've also discovered alcohols and solvents and ketones, molecules similar to acetone. So we have observed directly through optical and radio telescopes that massive molecular clouds that house the formation of the foundation molecules for life are present all throughout our galaxy. Now this has immense implications. After all, while this is not life, it is the foundation of life. And it only takes some other event to get those molecules to the form where they can be alive. This happened on the early Earth, and surely it must have happened on Venus and on Mars as well. So we had terrestrial planets whose conditions weren't quite right, but then when you think about it, the Earth was certainly not inhabitable when it formed. The air pressure was too high, the temperatures were too high, the atmosphere was poisonous. And yet, from all of that, life emerged. We do know that early life on the Earth was anaerobic, unable to breathe oxygen. And this makes perfect sense because there was no oxygen atmosphere. When we start scanning the skies for other exoplanets that may have life, oxygen would certainly be a positive sign if found in the atmosphere. But we also know that there can be worlds of anaerobic life where the energy levels are low, but the life does exist, but it certainly doesn't require oxygen to survive. This has a lot of implications. So we've identified the source of the organic matter in space, and there's an awful lot of it. We know where those molecules are and how they form, and we know that they're crucial to the formation of life. And this leads us to believe that life should be common throughout the universe. We do know many of the remaining steps to get to an actual living organism. But this isn't life. However, it's extremely encouraging. We know that the conditions for life would have existed on many of the terrestrial planets in our solar system, and even some of the asteroids and perhaps comets. And this explains why much of this material falls to Earth even today. But spacecraft on Mars didn't detect any organic molecules, or so it was said. And we have to understand why that is, and why we would still believe that life would be present there. You see, the molecules are present, the markers are present, and the conditions are present. Why wouldn't there be life? We'll talk about that after the break. This is Talk Universe.
Picture a dark, dark sky surrounded by stellar remnants, stars that have exploded, dust and gas is floating through the dark vacuum. The stars are shining in all directions, and nothing is here yet. But under the force of the pressure of the light from other stars, and under the pull of gravity, an immense molecular cloud, a nebula, comes together, and it begins to condense. And in the center of this dark, formless void is the beginnings of our sun, an immense ball of hydrogen gas. And around it are the chunks of material that will form our solar system. This is the protostellar nebula. This is the birthplace of our solar system. Many years ago, an astronomer by the name of Fred Hoyle said that life could be spread through the universe by comets, but even the comets had to form somewhere. George Wetherill, a scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey, studied the process of planet formation, these chunks of gravel and rock that came together in this early dark void, and he found that it took from 100 to 150 million years for planets to form. But take note of the fact that the sun would not have been ignited in this period of time. It would still be dark, hot, but not yet giving off light. So this is the environment from which the solar system and all of our planets came to be. You see, ice is a large factor in the formation of planets because little bits of material get coated with water molecules, and this thin foam of ice that forms on their outside allows them to stick together when they hit each other. At the moment of impact, the water liquefies, and the moment it rebounds, it freezes in a process called regelation. This allows the small particles of material, the rocks and gravel and dust, to stick together into ever-growing clumps. And the larger the clumps become, the more they can sweep up, until eventually they have enough gravity to pull other material to themselves. Our solar system is home to thousands of protoplanets, many thousands of them, and they moved in roughly elliptical orbits, but the average of their movements as they came together formed nearly circular orbits in most cases. And so the average momentum of the dust and gas carried over to all the particles that formed from it. Now, the sun was not ignited yet, and that's a very important point. If the sun were hot and giving off light and solar wind, it would drive away all the volatile molecules from the inner solar system. That would mean no water, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, none of the stuff needed to form the organic matter that came later. The fact that the material is here proves the sun was not yet lit. We also have a good idea of how dense the carbon monoxide methane, and other chemicals were because of the fact that there are diamond-coated meteorites. If the temperature is around 850 degrees centigrade and the atmosphere is about 0.2 atmospheres of methane gas, we get a growth of diamond film on objects. Since we have diamond-coated meteorites, we have a pretty good idea of what the stellar atmosphere was like during those periods of time. They're like a fingerprint or a snapshot of the past that allows us to see what the conditions were like. As the planets formed, the densest material, the metals, sank to the core. The lighter materials, the dross, came to the surface. So planets and small asteroids, and even the larger ones, are segregated into different materials. Metallic cores, rocky mantles, lighter minerals on the surface, and then organic chondrite material, carbonaceous material, on the surface. Every one of these young molten worlds would have been a ball of lava and would have given off a thick cloud of gas, an envelope of atmosphere, poison-thick choking lava exhaust. And Earth is no exception. All the terrestrial planets would have had this thick atmosphere to start with. And in those conditions, liquid water eventually could exist. But in most cases, the atmospheres would have been lost. Mercury is a prime example. It is as airless as the moon, and yet it shows what appears to be riverbeds, rills on its surface. The moon itself and Mars both show these riverbeds or rills. In the case of Mars, we know that there were oceans in its past. On the moon, was there ever water? It appears that when the moon formed and it was molten, enough material outgassed for a temporary period of time to form streams and lakes that flowed downhill and made these rills. Many geologists, lunar geologists, claim that these are dust slides or rock slides. But then it doesn't answer the question, how would these slides have produced the long winding channels, and if this was a rock slide, why isn't there a pile of rocks at the end of this channel?
The only logical answer is, the same conditions that allowed the formation of these thick atmospheres early in the molten histories of these worlds is also the same one that brought the organic matter to the surface and formed the organic molecules, and also formed these rills, because for a short period of time, there might have been liquid water on those bodies, but it is now long lost to space. Now, on planets with low gravity, these conditions don't last long, and they lose their atmosphere very rapidly. But other worlds, such as Venus and the Earth, hold on to their atmospheres, and it is there that the time for these processes to proceed has a chance to produce life. You see, the organic molecules are being produced under thick atmospheres, a mixture of gases, and energetic conditions, whether it's from heat or lightning discharge or from ultraviolet from the stars, or perhaps some other form of energy. But in any case, the conditions must be persistent for a significant period of time, otherwise we wouldn't find these materials. This is a signature of the fact that the asteroids that deliver carbonaceous materials must have been associated with a thick atmosphere for some duration. Otherwise, those molecules could not form. In other words, their very presence shows that the conditions for their formation must also have been present. Now, on the outer solar system bodies, such as Pluto, we see large amounts of tholin, but that's because for geological periods of time, the material has been frozen in an icy form and irradiated with the starlight. But in the inner solar system, the quantities of materials that we find had only transitory or fleeting conditions to form. You see, they couldn't have been easily carried here because they would have evaporated or cooked on the way. Now, that brings another interesting point. How do we get from these organic molecules to, let's say, proteins? It happens when they dry out. Since this material, tholin, is rich in amino acids, when it dries out, those amino acids fit together. They polymerize and produce random proteins. Now, out of the trillions of proteins produced, most won't have an opportunity to do anything in particular. It only happens if they're in a solution where the conditions are just right. But something else stands out, and that's this. In tholin, we also find random segments of RNA, ribonucleic acid, one of the foundations of the genetic code. And short random snippets of RNA often turn up replicating sections, pieces that automatically duplicate themselves. So when we stop and think about it, we've found that non-living material, when exposed to the proper conditions energy, forms organic molecules, and they exist all over space. Then we find, when those molecules dry up, they form proteins. And we also find that in those molecules are some genetic components that have the ability to replicate themselves without a cell being involved. We also find that when that material is ground up, the proteins that it forms come together to make tiny bubbles called coacervates. These have interiors and exteriors very much like a cell, and the different molecules that end up inside the coacervates make many of them act like protocells. So we're only a very short way from finding an actual early cell in this process. The steps we've taken are much closer to finding the resolution of the answer, how life begins. And in fact, we've already found some of those pieces in the debris of this randomly made organic material. So chemistry and physics have taken us from a humble beginning, the exploding of a star that has used up its fuel and scattered its material to space, to the formation of planetary nebula from the hydrogen that is present, the other molecules formed from these atoms, and the dust and gas. From here, we see the formation of a solar system, a star, and its planets from the same dust and gas, and also the formation of the materials that produce organic molecules. These molecules, in the proper conditions, go on to produce simple proteins and RNA, molecules that replicate themselves. So we've come from an exploding star to the point where we understand something about the formation of planets. And in the process, we see where the materials of life, tholin, come from. Now this is an interesting turn of events. We've always been presented with this as a great mystery. But we see that these same processes occurred in our own solar system. Life on Earth isn't a mystery. We've lived with it all the time. But when we look to other worlds, we see that the conditions are not hospitable. But is it possible that all the materials, all the makings, were there, and something went wrong? We know this is true in the case of Venus. It certainly was made of the same materials at the same time that the Earth was, and it had the same sun. But the temperatures on Venus rose rapidly as the sun warmed up. And the sun did warm up. It was much cooler in the past. It's gained temperature as it has aged. But we see that even if life did form on Venus, the heating would have destroyed it very early on. The entire planet is baked. 
But the atmosphere of Venus is also very thick even today, indicating that it had a very thick atmosphere in its past. It has over 90 times the atmospheric pressure that the Earth does. Now, how much air pressure would have been present on the Earth in its formation? If we estimate the amount of gas coming out of lava, and we look at samples of gas bubbles trapped in ancient rocks, we come to a startling conclusion. The Earth's early atmosphere had to be from 250 to 300 times as dense as it is today. What are the implications? For one thing, liquid water could exist at much higher temperatures in the early atmosphere than it can on the surface of the Earth today. At a temperature of 450 degrees C and a pressure of 250 atmospheres, water takes on a new condition known as a supercritical solvent state. It doesn't have a distinct line between being a liquid and a vapor. The formation of life is often put forward as having occurred in a cool, quiet pool somewhere. This is entirely at odds with the facts. The Earth would have been a scalding cauldron of steam and corrosive chemicals and thick poisonous atmosphere. So dense It would crush you or cook you or corrode you instantly. And the density of the atmosphere with these temperatures and the loading of organic molecules would make it equivalent, actually, to a sea in its own right. That is where the sea of life would have been, in the skies. Imagine the turbulence in thick water when you stir up silt or sand from the bottom. Now imagine an atmosphere so dense that the same process occurs and there's just as much clay, sand, and dirt in the sky as there is on the ground. You couldn't possibly exist under those conditions, and yet, the molecules for the formation of life certainly can. And this is the cauldron from which the stuff of life came. And did life form in some early ocean? Probably not. You see, the oceans would literally have been in the atmosphere, as a thick, soupy mixture of water and mud and organic molecules. And this is where we should look if we want to see how life truly began not to some quiet pool laying on the ground somewhere. And so we come to Mars. Now, it was formed at the same time from the same material as the Earth and Venus and Mercury. But Mars, being a little cooler and a little farther from the Sun, had slightly more clement conditions than the others. And so the formation of life there would have gotten an early start. The only drawback would be that with the low gravity, even though the conditions were very good early on, The atmosphere would rapidly have been lost, thinning out, consumed by loss to the vacuum of space, and by the organisms that began building whatever they were out of it. When you grow a plant, only about half a percent of that plant actually comes out of the soil. The rest comes from the sky, the nitrates, the carbon dioxide, the rainwater. All of that material is used to build the bulk of the plant, and only a tiny fraction, the minerals from the soil, make up the rest. We are mostly water, and that's true of all living things. Now consider the following. We know that there are fossils on the earth that indicate that life was here and present at least 3.8 billion years ago, which means that not long after it began, life probably was already in existence. We also have meteorites from Mars that appear to be 4.4 billion years old and also appear to contain traces of microscopic fossils. This is still debatable, it hasn't been resolved satisfactorily, but if they are, then it indicates that Mars took only 200 million years for its life to take hold. We might imagine that the same process occurred on Earth, but we still simply don't have remnants that we can examine that are old enough to see if those fossils exist. But if so, it means that the genesis of life occurs very rapidly on a geological scale, and in fact, it seems to be almost overnight. However, We do know that in the laboratory, in just a few weeks or years of experimenting, we've already come across most of the steps necessary for living organisms to form. So it indicates that life should be very, very common in the universe, and that it probably did take hold on at least three of the terrestrial planets. Venus, of course, is a lost cause at this point. Mars may still have organisms, if they ever existed, in its soil today, and only by really looking closely at what's present can we determine if it's a fact but there are very distinct traces that appear to be fossils present on Mars today. But the Earth, we know it's not a fossil planet. It's still alive and dynamic. Now to figure out if we're really looking at fossil remnants on Mars, and if life could exist today, we need to look at the conditions that were present at its genesis and how it would have changed over the years. And perhaps we'll find something we can look for as a definitive signature. This is Talk Universe. When you think of life on Earth, what do you think of? 
you think of the animals, the forests, the things on the land? Or do you think of all the creatures that live in the sea, the seaweed beds, the kelp, all of the fish? Everything that lives in the water clearly outmasses everything that lives on the land. The oceans are, after all, about three times as large in area as the land area of the earth. And it's also a very rich habitat. But there's also a habitat in the sky over our head. There are spores, bacteria, tiny insects, spiders suspended on threads of silk, seeds that float in the air. Many things live in the atmosphere over our head that are invisible. Now, this is not a very large portion of the biosphere, but it is a significant one. And yet, even if you take all of these together, you miss another amazing biosphere that almost nobody is aware of. Most of the life on Earth that is calculated is in the form of bacteria that live in the rock under your feet. Many of them consume minerals or petroleum for their food source and never see the light of day. These are anaerobes, creatures that cannot live in the presence of air, or oxygen more correctly, and yet they live very well on nothing but the chemistry and the heat and the moisture underground. If we consider life in the universe, we have to consider that since most of the life on Earth appears to be of the bacterial type that lives underground in a completely man-unfriendly environment, then perhaps the solution to where life in the universe is is on those planets that look barren and anaerobic to us and yet might be teeming with bacteria and other organisms. You see, when we think of the Earth as being a perfect environment for life, We're missing the fact that we're the odd ones out. Our environment is very rare and different compared to others. So, perhaps, since being in the rock would be the most logical solution, because you wouldn't require oxygen or sunlight or the other things we normally associate with life, maybe the largest bulk of life in the universe is in the form of bacteria in these airless environments. Now, since we see that much of the life on our Earth is really in the form of mineral-eating bacteria, we've also come to a greater understanding of things about cave formation, for instance. Most of the caverns that you see were actually formed not by the slow and patient action of water dissolving minerals. Most of the caverns that you see today were actually made by mineral-eating bacteria. These bacteria dissolve specific minerals looking for certain elements that they need to survive. And they do it in the absence of oxygen. So when you're visiting a cavern, you see structures that were actually made by bacteria. Now this viewpoint is becoming more widely accepted today, and it also provides an important clue to why we don't hear many messages from space that might be from alien life. Perhaps there's a lot out there, but we don't see a lot of signals. The universe should be full of life, and yet we don't hear radio waves very often that might be attributed to artificial generation. Stars make them, stellar phenomena make them, Certainly life can make them, but only if it reaches a certain level of technology. On Mars, we see an environment that looks forbidding, and yet we know that many bacteria in our own soil could easily live on the surface of Mars or even in the atmosphere of Jupiter. So there are earthly organisms that could survive on other planets in our solar system. Well, what if the organisms on those worlds are specialized for those environments, which is the only thing that makes perfect sense? Since most of the environment that we're looking for would be something that we as human beings could survive in pretty reasonably. We dismiss everything else that we see because it doesn't seem to us to be a hospitable environment. But for bacteria, simple organisms, and small things, it could be very inviting indeed. So what were the conditions like in the earliest days of Mars? It would have been very much like the early Earth. Thick, choking, poisonous atmosphere, high temperatures, conditions that a human being couldn't deal with. And yet, as the conditions improved, the organisms would have refined their means of surviving, and many of them probably would have moved underground. Now, as the atmosphere thinned and the amount of ultraviolet from the sun reached the surface, only those organisms that could survive ultraviolet would be present, and that again would be simple organisms, mostly bacteria. But even stromatolites, the organisms responsible for first bringing oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere in great quantity, have natural built-in sunblocker. Researchers have found that stromatolites have the genes to manufacture ultraviolet-blocking chemicals similar to the sun blocker you would use. So why would they have these genes? Clearly, they were exposed to a time when sunlight was not filtered by an ozone layer, and so they carried those genes on for the rest of their generations. We also find that there are many organisms that carry ancient genes within, 
the perfect question is, you've just spent the day evolving into the very first organism on Earth, and now you're hungry. What do you eat? The answer is tholin, that same material that is the foundation of all of life. It turns out that when the question was posed and they began to test organisms for their ability to dissolve and eat tholin, over 75% of the soil bacteria species tested were found to have the genes to do it, which indicates very clearly that their ancestors in the past did it quite often, or those genes wouldn't be present. Further tests showed that even coral in the oceans had the genes for using other series of minerals dissolved in the water than calcium carbonate. We know that in the past the ocean chemistry was different, and therefore the ability to have genes to use other minerals would be very useful. So as we start looking at the ancient gene library inside organisms on Earth, we discover that they have many of the keys for surviving in much more inhospitable climates. It would be no different on Mars or any other planet realize that organisms living on Mars would be exposed to some very severe conditions. But with the simple expedient of moving less than an inch under the surface of the soil, they reach conditions that would be very clement to many organisms that live right under your feet here on the Earth. So life on Mars at this point is probably going to be restricted pretty much to rock-eating organisms that live in extreme environments. Now, we have organisms on Earth that live in acid or alkali waters in very high temperatures in all sorts of conditions that would certainly kill a human being. Organisms living on Mars would also have similar abilities because otherwise they wouldn't be able to survive. So extremophiles, or organisms that live in extreme conditions, would be the norm on Mars today. But not long ago it appears there were oceans. Now realize something else. Even if your atmosphere is very, very thin and unable to support life on its own, any liquid water that exists can act as a surrogate atmosphere and provide the conditions necessary for organisms to survive anyway. Mars is no exception. We do know that there are occasional brine lakes on its surface and quite often flows of water that occur from buried ice underground that melts. You see, the oceans on Mars didn't vanish, but they're trapped under the soil in the form of ice and even glaciers. And every now and then we can see slope streaks where the melting underground ice produces a flow of water. Now, this wouldn't be pure water like you or I would wish to drink, but instead it would be laden with salts, such as magnesium sulfate and calcium sulfate. This is not water that you or I could use, but for other organisms it would be an ideal habitat. But then we also have to look at another possibility. In locations such as the Great Salt Lake in Utah, we find hypersaline, or very, very salty, brine waters. In these conditions, there are also organisms that have learned to deal with it, and one example is brine shrimp. Brine shrimp are tiny organisms, not much larger than a couple of millimeters, and they live in a transitory environment, one in which the conditions for life can come and go in a space of a few hours. Brine shrimp cope with it by laying eggs that go into cyst form. They're almost like spores, and they're dried out and very tough, and they can survive for over a century without water being present. When water does show up, they hatch within a few moments. They go through their life cycle very rapidly and then lay more eggs, which also can become dormant as almost spores for over a century. So an organism living in an environment such as Mars, where water would be transitory, might take advantage of those conditions and live within that water for their brief lives, and then hide within the soil, dormant, waiting for the next flow of water. We can see numerous types of organisms on the Earth that use this strategy for survival. A less extreme example is the Kalahari Desert, which looks very uninviting, and yet, for a brief period of a few days out of the year, the rains come, and the organisms emerge and reproduce as rapidly as they possibly can. For some marginally inhabitable worlds, or marginally livable worlds, this would be a very good solution, and Mars would be no exception. We see many signs of things that could possibly survive on Mars, and this is a set of strategies that would work very well. In fact, we've also discovered some organisms are able to go into hibernation by removing over 90% of the water in their bodies and becoming desiccated. There is a special sugar produced in their bodies to prevent damage to the drying out cells called trihalose. This particular sugar acts as a buffer and prevents the cell membranes from rupturing and the internal mechanisms of the cells from being damaged when they are dried out. There are cases of tiny organisms, such as tardigrades, being inside a storage case for over a century in the Royal Museum in London, and once struck by a few drops of water, they emerged within moments and began acting as if nothing had ever happened. Now, early in the history of Mars, it wouldn't have been too different from the early Earth. 
But as the conditions dried up, as the air became thinner, and organisms had filled most every niche, there would be a great move to stay in the oceans. When air is thin enough, as mentioned previously, the oceans, any source of water, can act as a surrogate atmosphere. By adopting the strategies of the brine shrimp, organisms could have found ways to survive increasingly long dry spells and extremely thin air. After all, we see some of those organism characteristics in species that live on the earth. Over time, as the air got thinner and the ozone layer might have been lost, we would see that organisms would become hardier, able to refine their ability to withstand less and less air pressure and more and more ultraviolet. And as the oceans dried, as the planet went into an ice age, the ability to remain in spore form or dried out form would have been a real advantage. So while it's quite possible that there are many organisms still available in the soil of Mars, and this could include fungus, bacteria, and spores of many types, it's also quite possible that we could find other more complex life, but reduced to a form where they can stay in hibernation for perhaps centuries at a time. So what would this life be like? Paradoxically, while we know that Mars appears to be a desert world, much of it could actually be sea life. Because, again, in an atmosphere so thin, it makes sense that a body of water would serve as your surrogate atmosphere. So, advanced life on Mars, if it were to survive in any form today, is quite likely to be the hibernating forms of vanished marine species. So, do we presently see any signs of that potential? In fact, we do. When we examine many of the craters, we can see layers of sedimentary rock have been deposited inside those craters. The sides of the craters, where they're blasted open from other impacts or from natural erosion, show the layering present from sedimentary deposits formed in water. Many of these layers are composed of gypsum, an evaporite mineral, as it's called. But what we see, which is most interesting, is the fact that the layers conform to the sides and shape of the crater which means that there had to be a lake or sea environment within the crater after it had formed. In other words, whatever was happening with liquid water on the surface of Mars, it persisted into the age well past the formation of those craters, and many of those craters are only a few million years old. What this tells us is that the conditions for marine life, if it ever existed, were still present just a short period ago on the surface of Mars. And one thing that we see is between the layers, there appear to be fine granules of silica, or fine dust of silica. This is a potential sign of marine organisms known as diatoms, or plankton. In an oceanic environment, the basis of the food chain is microbes that gather the sunlight and fix carbon for the atmosphere. Plankton performs this function in the Earth's seas, and it seasonally rises and falls in population. On a planet such as Mars, the gathering of basic energy and materials would be no different. It would depend on microbes. If we look at those layers and find those fine granules of silica, we see a possible sign of the existence of diatoms or another basis of the food chain in the oceans of Mars. And indeed, we do see areas of very refined silica dust in some of the samples. This is an interesting and tantalizing clue to the potential that marine life might have been the norm on this planet many years ago, and may persist today. But there are other environments on Mars that we haven't even touched. One would be the cave environment. We know that there are caves on Mars. We see signs of them from orbit. And so we know that there are places that could still serve as havens for existing forms of life of a rather more complex nature than microbes. Now, while there has been no accepted proof of microbes existing on Mars, we do know that water has persisted for geological ages from the beginning of the planet up until very close to the present day. Even now, we see eruptions of water on the surface and brine lakes in some cases. So, it is perfectly reasonable to assume that if life ever took hold on Mars, it would still be present today because nothing we know of would have autoclaved or sterilized the entire planet. This is an important point. I cannot stress enough that any unknown organism on another world would be something completely foreign to our immune systems and could cause great havoc if ever brought back to the Earth. There are organizations presently that are combating sample return missions for exactly this reason. This is Talk Universe.
So one of the big signs that there should be life on Mars and other worlds throughout our galaxy that are very similar to Mars, the first sign that really stands out is the long-term presence of water. We know of the importance of water to life. And when we see a world that's had water on its surface and in its interior for as long as Mars has, we immediately should have some red flags go up. You see, water is the solvent that we know of that makes life possible. On Mars today, we see slope streaks, we see pools of brine on the surface that come and go, we see effects that show that water has been present on a daily basis in many of the areas that we've examined. Our spacecraft have landed in places where water would have been common in the past, the beds of ancient seas, and we also see what appears to be long-term persistent lakes depositing layers of materials in the bottoms of craters. So the long-term presence of water alone would have ensured that life would have had one of its fundamental ingredients, and that water would have been present for most of the planet's 4.6 billion year history. But another sign showed up very early on when landers reached the surface, and this is something that was visually striking. The sphere rules. Billions upon billions of tiny, nearly identical spheres of roughly the same size. Scientists originally claimed that these were hematite concretions, but that explanation seems to be wearing a little thin. You see, while it's true that hematite does form small nodules like this inside stone that is damp for long periods of time, there's one interesting fact that seems to have been omitted. Concretions of this nature usually germinate around cores of organic material, such as clusters of algae cells. When we see these structures on the Earth, we know that they are a very good sign that algae existed there, and these structures, these nodules, grew around the colonies of algae. So why would we dismiss the possibility that when we find them on Mars in such quantities, that algae or some other organic matter might have been present for these to begin to form? Another interesting discovery was that there was methane, ammonia, and formaldehyde levels in the Martian atmosphere. Now, methane can be explained by volcanic processes underground because it sometimes causes methane to be vented. But this is a mineral source and not a biological one. But we see that the methane levels are changing with the seasons, which is an interesting thought. Why would methane, why would volcanoes, be active in a seasonal pattern? Perhaps the gravitation of the sun is having an effect on the planet, and it could be released through volcanic processes. But the effect appears concentrated in areas where we know that water would have been present in the past, and methane-eating organisms and methane-generating organisms, microbes of certain types, are known to exist on the Earth. So the seasonal plumes of methane do appear in areas where microbes would be most likely to be found. But the other two gases, ammonia and formaldehyde, are even more interesting. The reason is, ammonia and formaldehyde break down rapidly in the Martian environment. Ammonia breaks down in a couple of days, and formaldehyde in just a few hours. The only way we could continue to read these levels of these gases is if they're manufactured constantly. This evidence has also been dismissed. A physical sign from the rovers moving around the ground is very fine-grained silica. Now, silica forms in a number of ways, and one of them is associated with hot springs. But what is most interesting about the silica is this. When we examine the sedimentary layers of rocks, which clearly were deposited by water from ancient seas, we also notice that the silica appears to alternate. In other words, it appears in the spacings between the layers where the rock appears softest. So the silica shows up in alternating layers with whatever the mineral, the gypsum, is that forms the other harder parts of the rock. When you look at the ground, you can see that it erodes away in layers similar to the layers in wood. So part of the rock is harder and part of the rock is softer, and the softer part of the rock appears to contain the silica. The appearance of the silica is not precisely known in terms of density. However, since we know that seasonal changes on the planet occur roughly every two years, in a cycle twice as long as a seasonal period on Earth, and we know that the layers of rock are built up on a yearly basis, the silica appears to be alternating with the seasons. If we found rocks like this on the Earth, and we do, we would definitely conclude that the presence of the silica was rising and falling in a growth cycle, seasonally. And on Mars, it would appear that the silica is the remains of diatoms, those tiny organisms that are the fundaments of the food chain for the oceans. What is even more interesting is the presence of numerous identical structures. Of course, they're referred to as rocks, but 
why would rocks have exactly the same size and shape over and over, and an unusual shape at that? A section of a rind or a slice of an avocado, the interior of a seed pod, these rocks appear to be segments of a rind. If you ever cut an avocado open and remove the seed, you know it has a distinctive characteristic shape. This is also true of these particular rocks. Something formed these rocks again and again in different locations around the planet. They are too common to have been formed by random processes. Erosion doesn't produce the same features over and over again. So these rind-shaped rocks appear to be very close in structure to a marine organism known as a pentramite. These are relatives of crinoids that lived in the early seas of the Earth. And, on a world like Mars, we would expect that primitive organisms would be the rule of the day. So seeing these rocks again and again in numerous locations really gives us a clue that something very unusual is happening, and if it isn't biology, then we're at a loss to explain how geology alone could produce these structures many, many times. But this takes us back to the spherules again. When examined under the microscope, many of the spherules have identical markings. Erosion does not produce the same features again and again. When we're not able to explain something by typical geological processes, we must take the leap to the next stage. Perhaps this is the result of biology. So we have at least two samples in hand, these rind objects, and the fact that many of the spherules have identical markings. But if we look further, we see some of them have markings that are similar to pentagons or decagons. This is definitely a sign or a hallmark of biological action. The reason for this is simple. There are no five-pointed crystals in nature. Only extremely unusual chemistries will produce those, and it generally is done in a laboratory. Biology often produces five-pointed forms, and this is what we're seeing on the spherules. Now we go to some of the findings that are scattered around the planet, in particular those found by the Spirit rover on Sol 913, which appear to be seashells. Spirit landed in an area of Gusev Crater, which we knew would have had water for a long period of time, even when the oceans began to dry up. And what we find is amazing. There are numerous structures that are identical in appearance to seashells, down to having hollow walls, bubble-like structures, and structures within. Some of them, when broken open, actually show alternating patterns of chambers inside, just as a spiral would. There is no easy explanation for this. Many NASA scientists have claimed that these are volcanic bubbles. Yet, when confronted with these images, instead of analyzing them, the rovers have been sent in other directions. So it's never been resolved exactly what they are, because no observation has taken them to the point where they've actually put the microscope near them and given us a very good high-resolution view. It's almost as if every time something controversial appears, NASA turns the rovers and goes the other way. This is an issue that could be solved very easily. There is the presence also, from 1976, when Viking landed, of what appears to be biological activity in the soil. Now, we had instruments that were capable of detecting biology sent to Mars 40 years ago, but we have not since repeated that. We know what the chemistry of the soil is. We know how to produce devices that can see the results of biology, such as detecting metabolism and its products. But why, in 40 years, have we not sent another such package to the surface of Mars? Our technology has improved to the point where we could easily identify processes such as life and growth, and yet NASA has not yet sent another mission capable of doing that. It's as if they're dancing around the point rather than going to the core and finding out for sure. One strong indicator that remains on the planet is rock varnish or desert varnish. On Earth, if you go to an arid desert, you will often find that there's a dark, glossy coating on the rocks. This coating has been used in times past by Native Americans to inscribe patterns of markings called petroglyphs, but nobody knew exactly what the coating was until recent times. It appeared to be something that grew slowly in areas of the desert where the tips of rocks were stuck up and exposed to wind. Closer examination showed that there were two microbes associated with this effect, metallogenium and pedomicrobium. What's so unusual about this is both of these microbes make their living by ingesting metals, and as a result, they excrete a hard silica-like coating on the rock that is dark in color. In particular, they like to eat manganese, some molybdenum, and iron. Now, why would organisms eat metal? In some areas where organic matter is scarce, 
there are microbes, particularly anaerobes, that are capable of ingesting metals instead. They feed literally on minerals. As mentioned previously, microbes appear to be responsible for the formation of many caverns. Well, this is in keeping. You have an organism that lives in the open, does benefit from sunlight, but takes advantage of the wind and the thin coating of moisture that sometimes is carried with it in desert environments. What's most unusual is this. When we examine the silica coating that desert varnish is, we not only find those two microbes, but we also find something amazing, reversed amino acids. If any organism on Earth were examined, we would find the presence of a reversed amino acids to be something extremely rare. So why would we find an organism that lives in such a Mars-like environment, arid and forbidding, also has a very strange diet, metal atoms, and also seems to produce reversed amino acids? Is it possible that desert varnish organisms were actually carried here on a meteorite from Mars? It would not be an unheard of thing. We know that meteorites take millions of years to travel through space, and it would take a very hardy organism to make the trip. Rock varnish is clearly on many of the rocks on Mars, and yet no examination of their structure has been done as well. Another curious question is why has no serious researcher yet taken a gene sequencing of desert varnish and done an in depth analysis of exactly what it is? We may very well have Martian organisms living on the Earth carried here by meteorites from some times in the past. And some meteorites from Mars do in fact show what appears to be the remains of microscopic fossils, as well as a coating of desert varnish. We have the ability to answer these questions, and yet it's not being done. With so much technology and hardware and so much information to work from, we should know the answers to these questions already. Is there life in the universe? Certainly there is and it appears that it's right next door on Mars, a very inhospitable world. After all, its conditions were much better in the past, but today they're very forbidding. And even though we have rovers on the surface, which have excellent instruments and imaging capabilities, we still have not taken the time to examine some of these mysterious seashell-like structures, or any of the other fossil-like structures that exist, and in fact some have actually been ground up and destroyed. Any time a mystery arises, instead of analyzing it, the rovers go the other way or ignore it entirely. We have the capability of finding out if this truly is fossilized remnants of what could have been ancient life. If we find life on Mars and it's definitely known to be the case, then it raises a lot more questions than it answers. After all, knowing that there is life on such a terribly inhospitable world would raise the possibilities that there would be much more life on more clement worlds such as some of the exoplanets we've discovered. But it also raises another question. Why do we not hear signs of intelligence in space? The rules of chemistry and physics are the same throughout the universe, and we would expect that since we see giant molecular clouds and we see organic compounds in space, that there should be entire worlds just as advanced as the Earth, or at least very similar to the Earth. We would expect other civilizations would be out there crying into the darkness as well. Their radio signals, whether intended or not, would be reaching us. But there's one other idea we haven't even talked about, and it's this. If and when we confirm that life is present on Mars, it will be the first other world where we find alien life. And if this is the case, it also becomes a test for us. Will we allow our own organisms to contaminate and potentially destroy the biosphere, the first alien world with life that we discover? The answer to that question may say much more about us as human beings than any other. So this concludes our second installment of our six-part Mars series, and I think that the information we presented will give you a lot to think about. We probably are not alone in the universe, and we probably do have life on Mars, I believe so, and you're going to see a lot of the information that we're going to present showing why. I'm also going to try and get an interview with an astrobiologist who will present some information about his research and what it says about the potential for life on Mars. There will be a number of uh, images posted on the site as well, so you can look at them and see and um, draw your own conclusions. But there is some very, very solid evidence, in my opinion, for life on Mars. And have a look at those pictures. And all of them go back to NASA and other space agencies, so they're all verifiable. Another really important question is, what do we learn from Mars that we can carry over to the Earth? And if we keep destroying our environment, will the Earth end up being like Mars, a, an apparently dead world? I'm Sir Charles Sills, and you've been listening to Talk Universe.